Welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 189. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons. And as always, I'm joined by the man with a plan, Mr. Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. Hey, good morning, Mike. I gotta say, I am super excited for us launching into a brand new series for the Moonshot Show today. Are you excited? Well, I hopefully will be feeling a whole lot happier, Mark. What about you? (laughs) That's right. Today, listeners and members, we are diving into a brand new type of series on the Moonshot Show. Today, we're diving into happiness. And we're going to launch into the idea and theme of happiness with a book by Dan Harris called 10% Happier, How I Tamed the Voice in My Head, Reduced Stress Without Losing My Edge, and Found Self-Help That Actually Works. Mike, I mean, that's got to be one of the um, more appropriate and more enticing uh, titles for books that we've done on the show, wouldn't you say? Yeah, well, if his headline and title was 10% Happier, that that payoff, that subheading is the longest subheading we've ever had on the show. How I tamed, (laughs) let's just go through it. How I tamed the voice in my head, reduced stress without losing my edge and found self-help that actually works, dash a true story. Mark, it is, um, it might be a like big and verbose uh, subtitle, but actually there's so much in this book. That's why we've chosen to start this series uh, with 10% Happier by, by Dan Harris, because it goes after something that, let's be honest, happiness, it's kind of elusive. It's kind of a mm. thing that is hard to find and in the reality of of our daily lives, we often find stress a lot quicker than we find happiness. And Dan Harris, well, he may have had a very public breakdown, which as listeners, you might remember, but he found a way out of his breakdown and he's written a book about it. So I'm Mm. really looking forward to sinking our teeth into 10% Happier by Dan Harris. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, I, I'm really excited to hear from Dan and we'll launch into that first clip in a second as well about what happiness uh, is, how we can achieve it and what it means to each of us. Because I think what we're going to find out, Mike, through the series is how happiness has different interpretations and different benefits for each of us. And I think what's really nice about Dan, as we're about to hear, is his approachableness and his ability to, I think, break down what happiness means to him. Yeah. And, and I think, Mike, the fact that he had, as a TV news anchor, he had a very public uh, breakdown, freak out on television, right? He, he literally had a panic attack live on air, didn't he? Yeah, that's right. And I mean, maybe, Mike, the best way for us to hear about this event this uh, moment of uh, pivoting for Dan Harris is actually to hear from our first clip of the show, which is Dan Harris himself introducing us to why he wrote the book, 10% Happier, and actually what happened when he had this very public panic attack. We are going to turn to a story we're calling 10% Happier. We're trying something a little different on Nightline tonight because I'm going to tell you a story about me. Actually, it's not just about me because I found a way to make myself significantly happier and it could probably work for you, too. I stumbled upon this whole thing as a result of a bizarre, unplanned odyssey, and it all started with the most embarrassing day of my life. From ABC News, this is Good Morning America. We're going to go now to Dan Harris is at the news desk, Dan. Good morning, Charlie and Diane. Thank you. This is me 10 years ago. And the reason this is the most embarrassing day of my life is not that it looks like I've been attacked by a blow dryer and a can of hairspray. No, it's that I am about to freak out on national television. Health news now. One of the world's most commonly prescribed medications may be providing a big bonus. Researchers report people who take cholesterol-lowering drugs called statins for at least five years may also lower their risk for cancer. But it's too early to to prescribe statins slowly for cancer production. At this point, I realize I'm helpless, so I bail right in the middle. Uh, That does it for news. We're going to go back now to Robin and Charlie. The control room, clearly taken by surprise, continues to roll video for the next story about Harry Potter, which I was no longer able to read. All right. Thanks very much, Dan Harris at the news desk with some of the headlines of the morning. Want to go to Tony Perkins now? Once the fear subsided, humiliation rushed in. 
I knew with rock solid certainty that I had just had a panic attack on national television. So why would I tell you this very embarrassing story? Because that on-air meltdown was the culmination of something that had been building for years, something I never stopped to address. It's something we all battle, whether we have panic attacks or not. Call it the voice in your head. You know the voice I'm talking about. The often nasty inner narrator who discourages and derails you when you're considering going after opportunities in your life. That stew of urges and impulses that has you losing your temper and regretting it later or putting your hand in the fridge when you're not even hungry. And for many of us, it's that nagging temptation to float off into our own heads instead of actually listening to people. Kind of caught me and a wife at a bad town. It's a love story. My favorite comedian, Dave Chappelle, nailed it on his show. A classic for Monkey. He spins <laughs> NASCAR race. <laughs> Unicorns. In my case, like many Americans, my inner voice was pushing me to succeed. Annual New Year's party in New York. This is me in my late 20s. Thank you, Dan. Dan. I had my dream job, but I also had doubts about whether I was good enough. But it's hard to do that. All right, I'm going to try it. Three, two, one. My solution? Become a workaholic. After 9-11, I volunteered to spend years in war zones where I covered the heroics of our men and women overseas and got a real taste of both the horror and the adrenaline of combat. Americans to institute health care for... Now, here I am back home. Yeah, practice makes perfect, you know? I may look okay, but the guy you see here... He's having trouble getting out of bed. This tax debate is one of the clearest choices in this election. After years of always barreling forward, when I finally slowed down, it was as if my mind revolted and I got depressed. And so in my free time, I briefly but stupidly began self-medicating, even using cocaine, which my doctor would later tell me almost certainly produced that on-air panic attack. That realization that I'd been blindly letting my urges and impulses yank me around became a turning point. Oh my gosh. Things got really out of control for Dan Harris. Right. Not only was he having that panic attack on air, but when you hear that subsequent breakdown, whilst it's scary because he was so out of control, you can also, I'll have to admit, you can kind of see yourself in it as well, can't you, Mike? Well, absolutely. I, th- I think what's interesting, well, I mean, obviously it's, a, it's an amazingly unique um and perhaps surprising story. But I think the relation that I can take from that is this idea of trying to be the best, you know, this, this voice that, that Dan Harris calls out, maybe driving him into those war zones to uh, progress his career. Ultimately, he thought he was going out and doing these things because it made him happy. But actually what I think he slowly realized when he eventually did have that, that public, uh, as he calls it, freak out or, or panic attack is, um, he realizes, oh, well, that wasn't what I wanted after all. If anything, it was negatively impacting me. And I think this is going to be a classic theme that we'll probably run into a lot on the happiness series, which is what actually are you most happy about? Right. Right. Is it, is it something where you're putting yourself in the war zone or is it actually just taking time to, to work on yourself? Yeah. And I think the hard thing in this is like, sometimes you have to push into challenge and adversity in order to do good things, right? Like if you're working on something good, it doesn't necessarily mean the day is going to be easy or stress-free. It's also about knowing the line between a healthy stretch and then an unhealthy stretch, don't you think? Well, yes. And then that unhealthy stretch for for Dan was this idea of self-medication. So he was probably going into these uh, environments, both from a war zone perspective, as well as professionally, you know, putting himself into the key um, events or talks and so on. Mm. And then thinking, okay, well, if I'm doing all this, then I need to find myself with a bit more energy or I need to be the best version of myself. And I'll, instead of looking towards, um, let's call them proactive or maybe healthy alternatives, Mm. he then went into this self-medication process, which ultimately again led to a a decline in the way that he was functioning and performing. I think it's, I think it's a pretty relatable story really, where somebody tries to push themselves hard, finds they start getting tired and instead of slowing down or taking the foot off the gas, they find reasons or ways to, to power themselves forward. 
And I, so I think, you know, what is super useful in what we heard from Dan Harris, author of 10% Happier, right then is like whether you're feeling a little bit too anxious about something, whether you've developed some bad habits or coping mechanism, it doesn't really matter. I think the, the beauty in today's show is that we've got somebody who's been in the valley of darkness and he got out. And so mm. there's a little bit of help he can give all of us. Um, So ahead of us in the show, we're going to learn about mindfulness. We're going to learn about how to get ourselves in good shape. And it's going to be super practical. It's going to get our um, thinking. Uh, It's going to get all that monkey mind, which is something we've talked about, or mind chatter, how to tackle that voice in your head and how to get yourself on the right track to be the best version of yourself. So what a great way uh, to start the day. What a great way to start this series. i tell you what's also really good, Mark, is celebrating and tipping our hat to all of our members. We are just four members short of launching our merch line. The designs are done. The store is ready to go. And it's thanks to you, our members, that we're that close, that close, Mark, to launching mm-hmm. the merch to getting those moonshots, uh, T-shirts and all the other goodies that we've got ready for you. But, Mark, I think it's only appropriate that we tip the hat to all of our members. I'm going to tip the moonshots branded hat to all of our (laughs) members uh, (laughs) via Patreon, including Dan Dan Dananana, Bob and Niles, John, Terry, Neil, Marjolin, Ken, Dietmar, Marjan, Connor, Rodrigo, Yasmin and Lisa, Sid, Mr. Bonjour, Maria, Paul and Berg, Kalman and David, Joe, Crystal, Evo and Christian, Hurricane Brain, Samuela, Kelly, Barbara and Bob, Andre, Matthew, Eric and Abby, Jose, uh, Joshua, Chris and Kobe, Damien, Deborah, Gavin and Lassie, Tracy, Steve, Craig, Lauren and Javier. I mean, Mike, halfway through, I think I lost track. The <laughs> list has become so long. <laughs> We're super grateful uh, for all of your support because that helps us pull everything together, pay for all the different services it takes to create, produce, edit, distribute the entire show to get it out to all four corners of the planet. So thank you to our members. We really do appreciate your support. It means a world to us, the fact that you're kind of seeing the value in what we do and giving a little value back. Um, So hopefully we can do that right now as we continue the journey into Dan Harris and 10% Happier. And something that I battle with is something called the monkey mind. And Dan Harris has some thoughts on that. So let's jump in. I'm not going to lie to you. It wasn't like awesome. Uh, You know, it's hard. Um, You know, the act of sitting there, trying to focus on one thing, getting lost and returning is, you know, takes grit. It's kind of like holding a live fish in your hands. And uh, especially when you're new, it's it's like learning. It, it is, it's not like, it is learning a new skill and it's, it takes a little while to get used to. That being said, I very quickly started to notice some significant benefits. Uh, the first was my ability to focus got better. I can't prove this, just so you know. I just said, I'm, I, I feel that it's true, but I didn't have my brain scanned before or after. Um, however, there have been studies that show that meditation can help with your ability to focus. We live in the age, uh, an age that's been called uh, the info blitzkrieg. You know this better than anybody. Uh, and it is very hard to do one thing at a time. And in my job, I literally have other people's voices directly in my ear through an earpiece. It's really hard to focus and yet very important that I do so because I need to get the story correct. I need to report it correctly. So I just found that the daily exercise of trying to focus on one thing and then getting lost and starting over really helped me with that. The second benefit uh, uh, was the big one, and it's this word mindfulness. It's become somewhat of a buzz phrase. Oddly, it's also kind of like a boring, anodyne-sounding word, but it is a game-changing proposition. Um, a simple, serviceable definition of mindfulness, which, by the way, it's in like an incredibly rich term. It goes back you know, 2,500 years into all the Buddhist texts. But let me give you a simple definition that can be relevant in your life, which is it's the ability to know what's happening in your head at any given moment without getting carried away by it. I'm just going to say that again. Not to be didactic, but it's useful to hear it twice. It's the skill of knowing what's happening in your head right now 
without necessarily taking the bait and acting on it. So let's just think about how useful this could be. You're standing online at Starbucks or at one of your 5,000 micro cafeterias here, and um, somebody cuts you off. What happens? You think to yourself, I'm pissed. And then what happens next? You automatically, reflexively, habitually inhabit that thought. You actually become angry. There's no buffer between the stimulus and your reaction. With mindfulness on board, with a little bit of meditating, meditating, you might be able to notice after that person cuts you off, oh, you know, my chest is buzzing, my ears turning red, I'm having a starburst of self-righteous thoughts, I'm getting angry. But maybe right now I don't need to act on it. I, uh, I like to think there, there's, a, there's another way to think about this. Um, I'm, I'm not a good artist, but I drew this. Um, you can think of the mind as a, a waterfall. Um, and the, that's, the, that's the water coming down. Those are your thoughts. Most of them have to do with me, me, me. Mindfulness is the area behind the waterfall. You are stepping out of the traffic and watching what's happening non-judgmentally. We have three habitual reactions to every piece of every stimulus in our life. We want it. We don't want it. We don't care. And mindfulness is a, a fourth option, which is to just see it dispassionately without getting involved. Um, if you think I'm making this up, it is worth noting that we as a species are classified as homo sapiens sapiens, which means the man or woman who thinks and knows he thinks. But the second sapiens has, has been atrophied with time because nobody points out to us that we have this bonus level in our brain, which is the ability to step out and watch it calmly and not judgmentally. I mean, this is something that is so important, Mike, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The ability to be aware without reacting. I think we've we've run into this uh, a couple of times on the Moonshot Show, particularly when we're digging into uh, Eckhart Tolle with the power mm -hmm. of now. And I'm sure we, we, we're going to both enjoy digging back into, into that in a minute as well. But this idea of being aware of what's happening in your body and maybe even what's happening in your mind, the areas that you're leaning towards, that person's frustrated me, um, all panic because I've got an email that I've got to respond to. And instead, or, or even getting angry with a, with a partner or a colleague, and instead of reacting, just observing is, is something that's so intrinsic and really interesting, I think, when we think about happiness as a, a method to, you know, protect your emotions, I think is a fascinating little framework. What do you think? Well, you know, I, I was listening to that clip again, Mark, and I was thinking about Eckhart Tolle, Dan Millman, both of whom we've done mm. shows on. So if you are interested in this mindfulness, definitely want to check out those two guys uh, on moonshots.io. Have a listen to those shows. I mean, they really talk to some of this stuff. But, you know, the, the, what's so brilliant about the show, Mark, is that even though we've gone to the, like, some of the leading gurus on mindfulness and being present, we get someone like Dan Harris comes along and, and uses this analogy of the waterfall and stepping back and letting the water pass you. Mm. I cannot tell you how well that captures what, for me, I hope to achieve through mindfulness, what I hope to achieve really through that, um, you know, that, that sort of fourth alternative to experiencing the world, which is just observing without judging. Because what I notice about myself is if I'm not careful, um, you know, I can, um, be too, uh, on too much of a roller coaster, I guess is a good way of saying it, with all the ups and downs of all the work that I do, all the things in my personal life and professional life. I mean, that can be exhausting. And it reminds me um, of something that people comment on in parents where, where parents sort of live through the ups and downs of their children. And, you know, this is exhausting because you have your own life and then you're sort of also living through the ups and downs of your child because you love them and you want the best for them. It's all good intentions, but it's an exhausting process. I relate so much to, to this idea of being more disciplined in choosing how you participate. And I think something that's been so big on the show, Mark, 
is you might not you might not be in control of everything in your life, but you certainly have control over how you want to respond. And I think this is one of the biggest single ideas that we're going to get from Dan Harrison, that we are in control of that response. And it's something that we've seen with the likes of Eckhart Tolle, with the likes of Dan Millman, we are in control of our response. Mm. And if you do choose to take control in that, that's how you tame the voice in your head. Would you agree? Uh, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more, to be honest. I mean, there have been plenty of times for me when that lack of, let's say, awareness of the present moment has led me to waste minutes, hours, days, or, or weeks or longer. <laughs> right. We all do right? it. <laughs> because, and as, as Eckhart Tolle calls out in The Power of No, now, every minute that you spend worrying about that future, Mm. Or every and the future being where am I going to be? What what's my job? Mm. Uh, what car am I going to drive? Mm. Or conversely, every minute that you spend regretting the past, so oh, I I shouldn't have said this, or I wish I'd done that. I regret not doing this. Is a minute lost because all you really, all of us, any uh, really do is live right here, right now, in the present, sitting in front mm. of our microphones, recording the Moonshot Show. Mm. So this this awareness, this ownership, this ability to catch yourself, let's say before you jump into the waterfall mm. <laughs> and instead you can see the water is barreling past you and instead of getting washed away and maybe um, distracted and so on, instead you can just watch it and say, okay, well, my emotions are moving pretty fast now, but that's okay mm. because I know where I am. I'm in my room. And we, we learn lots of good tips about how to stay in the room in, in the power of now and, and our series around then. But what was interesting for me when I hear Dan, again, he's just, he's like an everyman, Mike. He's a guy mm. that was just one day had a bit of a, bit of a, a, a challenge and then went on this odyssey of learning um, new skills and new practices and frameworks and behaviors. But the thing that really stands out to me when I hear him tell these, these stories and these anecdotes is the ability to catch himself when he is starting to feel maybe overwhelmed or stressed or whatever you want to call it. And then being able to proactively uh, change or, or just notice his mind, observing how he's reacting, I think is, is something that I think we can all strive to try and go and do. Yeah. And I think what the great news is, I think anybody who's listening right now is probably thinking, okay, this Dan Harris guy had a tough moment, can relate to that, seems to have found this mindfulness that's all good for Dan, <laughs> but how mm-hmm. do I do it? And <laughs> be rest assured, Mark, you and I are going to like really decode that, get into some very practical habits, tips, advice, framework, everything you can do. And it really spans this idea uh, from how to relax, how to become aware, particularly of your body, which brings you into the moment, breath work, gentle movement, meditation. I think the summary here is how we can think less and be more. That's Mm. what's ahead of us in in the show. But I think what's important right now is to establish that we all experience things where anxiety and stress uh, really start to dominate how we're feeling, being, and thinking, and how we can really that voice in our head can really kind of take control of the situation. The good news is that we can tame the monkey mind, the mind chatter. The answer is mindfulness. And now that we've kind of established that logic, I think what it gives us the opportunity to do is actually get into some of the things that you can do right after you press Uh, pause on this show, you can go and do them. You can tame the voice, you can reduce the stress, and you can actually go out into the world um, and actually be the best version of yourself. I mean, it's such a powerful set of mindset up front, but then equally, we're going to really get into some great habits, aren't we, Mark? Yeah, that's right. And another habit that I think we should uh, remind ourselves, Mike, as we look at our daily to-do lists and, and writing in our journals is popping along into our podcast app of choice and leaving a little rating or a review for the Moonshot Show, wouldn't you think? 
Oh man, I heard there is good karma, lunar powered good karma if you do this kind of thing. That's right. And all it takes, Mike, is uh, just hitting pause, or even you could let the podcast carry on playing in your headphones or over your speakers. Pop along to the Apple Podcast or the Spotify app or any of the other overcasts and so on, anchors of all the podcast apps, and just leaving us a little rating or review for the Moonshot Show. It really does make a difference. If anything, Mike, I think it makes you and I more than 10% happier because we, because we get ourselves into the ears and the minds of listeners from all over the world who we know really benefit from checking out the show, wouldn't you say? Oh yeah. And I mean, look, who doesn't want to be 10% happier, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, uh, let's be honest, but really if if you're listening right now and you, and you have this moment, I would really ask that you just unlock your phone, jump into Spotify, go in there, give us a like, jump into Apple Podcasts, give us a rating or review. We would so, so very much appreciate it. I mean, what you have to realize is we have listeners all over the world. We have listeners in Mexico, Norway, New Zealand, Saudi Arabia, Argentina, Singapore, Taiwan, Nepal, Angola, Macau, Estonia. We have literally thousands and thousands of listeners. Every single one of them is trying to be the best version of themselves. And I think that is so cool that we can learn out loud together. So you can be part of spreading the moonshots message, which is that you have the chance to be the best version of yourself. Come learn out loud together. Give us a rating or a review and we would deeply appreciate it. And you'll be connected to you know, just to call 55, 60,000 other people <laughs> on that exact same mission. So Mark, we're on a mission right now to be 10% happier. Where do you want to start some real habit design, things we can do every single day? Well, we heard a little bit from Dan in the first half of today's show, referencing and relating to his uh, difficulties, I suppose you call them, with getting into meditation and mindfulness and the impact the monkey mind had on him being able to pick it up as a habit. So let's hear now from Dan from a very, very practical perspective. Give us some three steps, three tips uh, around how he was able to get past that initial reluctance and try meditation. I always assumed meditation was for people who like crystals, incense, and John Tesh music. In other words, there was no way I was going to meditate. But then I heard about scientific studies showing that meditation can, among other things, lower your blood pressure and boost your immune system. And then I learned that meditation does not necessarily involve wearing robes, lighting incense, or believing in anything in particular. People of any faith or no faith can do it. In fact, it's totally straightforward. There are basically just three steps. Number one, sit upright. Doesn't have to be cross-legged. You can do it in a chair, on the floor, whatever. Two, just try to feel your breath coming in and going out. And three, whenever your mind wanders, which it will a million times, simply return your attention to the breath. So one day after I learned all of this, I very reluctantly gave it a shot. Breathe in. What kind of bird was Big Bird? Breathe out. Do I need a haircut? What's the difference? Shrubbery. I decided yeah. pencils I like should be yellow. In a way, it was like the panic attack. My mind hurling lots of crazy thoughts at me. Idea for old school if hip-hop a vegetable, show, rap Van Winkle. Why? But this time, I had a weapon. Get in the game, dude. In those in. brief moments where I was Breathe simply out. focused on my breath. Breathe in. Breathe out. It was like Breathe pressing the in. mute button on the Breathe voice in my out. head. Where did Breathe gerbils in. run wild? Breathe out. But I describe out. myself as more of a Breathe baller in. or a shotgun. Breathe out. And it created Breathe space in. between the Breathe thoughts out. before they inevitably came marauding back in. Meditation is like exercise for your brain. I'm not speaking metaphorically here. Check this out. Brain scans show that short daily doses of meditation literally grow the gray matter in areas associated with self-awareness and compassion and shrink the area associated with stress. As for me, it's not like my life has become a nonstop parade of rainbows and unicorns. I still sometimes let work stress me out and distract me, but my emotions and impulses no longer yank me around as much, which, frankly, is a superpower. Meditation has also helped me slow down enough that the good stuff in my life has become much more vivid, from the fact that ABC lets me be the co-anchor of Nightline to simply eating cookies with my wife or playing with our cats. An important point here, it is possible to get happier in this way without going soft. These Marines here are part of an experiment 
To see if meditation makes more resilient warriors. The first time they said to you, we're going to teach you how to meditate, what was your gut reaction? Uh, this is going to be absolutely ridiculous. Corporate executives are using it too. Even the lead singer of Weezer, who told me meditation helped him cure crippling stage fright. It's about eight, eight years ago I started practicing two hours every day. And uh, at first, the, actually, the, the unpleasantness got worse before I was going on stage. And I was wondering, is, is this really working? But I stuck with it. And now I feel so much calmer. And check out this list of other conditions meditation has been shown to be good for. There are no miracle cures, despite what you hear from the self-help gurus. I like to say meditation has made me roughly 10% happier. If it could work for a fidgety, skeptical newsman, maybe you too should give it a shot. Ah, that's so good. A fidgety, <laughs> skeptical newsman. It can work for you too. Mark, I just want to relate to what he was talking about. You know, he was joking around at the beginning there about how your mind actually works when you try to meditate. Mm. And mm. here's how I relate to it. When I first uh, tried to meditate, what blew me away, what really put as a stark contrast for me is attempting to think of nothing is really hard. And I didn't realize how hard it was until I tried to meditate. Said differently, I didn't realize how much I suffered from monkey mind, yeah. mind chatter, right? Yeah. Until I actually tried to meditate and go, wow, I've just noticed my brain just started thinking about something. You bring it back to nothing. And then it's like, it's like a, a young kid that doesn't want to stand still and just runs off on you all the time. Mm. It is incredible. This, what, what we're going to call this monkey mind, how until you really attempt to meditate, it's not until then that you realize just what is actually happening in your mind. And the build on this is, and this will be a big theme of this show and happiness is that you are not your thoughts. Your thoughts are different from who you truly are. But just to come back to this, my personal journey with meditation was once I actually started trying to do it, I realized, A, it's hard. Two, oh my gosh, my mind just wants to run, run, run. But this has given me the the passion and, and the desire to work at it because, Mark, between you and me and 55,000 other people, I was like, oh my God, my mind is totally bonkers. It just will not stop. And if that's the case, I've really got to work on this meditation thing now mm -hmm. because I didn't realize how hard it would be for me just to slow the hell down, to, to, to use the, um, what we were talking about before, just to observe without mm. judgment and just let things go and come to this peace. I was like, no wonder I feel so exhausted after a week. My mind is yeah. racing all the time. How have you found it? I, I've found it um, almost the, the monkey mind for me is something that gets in the way of enjoying um, the present moments, you know, and, and this is probably something that relates to you a lot as well as, as for Dan, it gets in the way of maybe enjoying weekends because you're thinking about uh, either work or, or pressures of, of some other kind. So that monkey mind, when you then put it into a, a mindfulness or meditation perspective, I would relate it to having notifications, digital notifications constantly going off. So you're getting messages, you're getting emails, you're getting uh, distractions while you're trying to sit down and just have a moment of peace. Mm. And we know from the Moonshot Show how damaging and disruptive those digital um, distractions can be when right. we're trying to do our best work. Mm. So if you've constantly got your notifications from Slack, WhatsApp, WeChat, whatever, constantly pinging in the background, you're not going to be able to sit down and really do your best work because your mind will be elsewhere. This is something that we've heard from Cal Newport a lot. And for me, what I want to try and take us on, an, on a journey for is to think of our monkey mind kind of like a digital, uh, uh, kind of like the distractions that constantly ping in our own heads. Unless you can work on silencing them, 
quite literally putting your monkey mind into do not disturb mode. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and then being able to, love it. to uh, focus on something that's going to be worthwhile, isn't it? We know the, the value of putting off uh, do not disturb uh, and the turning off notifications. So why not try and make the case for the same reason, but in your own mind? I love this idea. You know, your your brain is like an iPhone and you need to put it on do not disturb, right? That's mm. that's the the idea that you have, right? Exactly. Exactly. And and obviously as we're hearing from Dan, from yourself, when we did our, our timeless classics with with Eckhart Tolle, it takes time and that's okay. I think it takes everybody time, doesn't it? Mm. It's like working any type of muscle. You've got to practice yeah, it might be a little bit painful at the start, but actually the benefit that, that we'd all get from accomplishing that um, silencing, let's call it, or just that exercise is, is pretty substantial. What, what are the benefits yes. that you've already felt, Mike, through your, your, your practice, your process? Um, well, you know, the funny thing is like the way I, what I've discovered through meditation is that for probably 27 years, I've just been in fifth gear. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I've lived in four different countries. I've had a number of jobs, created startups, sold startups, worked at large companies, worked, I work across all these time zones. I have so many things going on that I'm like, I discovered through meditation, I was locked in fifth gear, like just Mm -hmm. perpetual adrenaline, performance, uh, producing stuff. And so the, the ancient wisdom of in order to go fast, you need to go slow. It it is fully dawned on me that I, I need to, um, to meditate, to pause, to be still, to be calm, to just observe and not judge just to like Mm. chill the hell out. And, what has blown me away is the awareness of how much work I have to do to actually get to that. Because for so many years, I've just been locked into fifth, like just actually going down into fourth and third gear, heaven forbid, just putting it into first gear or, or (laughs) you know, it's, it's really, really hard because I've got this habit but when I do meditate, which for me is breath work as well as um, just total stillness meditation. There's all sorts mm. of different types of meditation, which you can check out, like focus meditation, non-focus meditation. Um, for me, finding so much um, satisfaction in calmness, like calmness is so deeply satisfying, particularly for someone like me who has a lot of energy what is so amazing is that you can just find this flow and this comfort in meditation that is crazy good. And it's true when you do put your mind to something, if you've got a really good meditation practice going on, like I notice if I've been doing it for a couple of weeks consistently, I just notice much more karma, like the mm. sharpness of my thought. It's so quick and so precise compared to the kind of that, that fuzziness that you have when you're too, uh, too stressed or, yes. or just too busy in the head, like things just come intuitively. And then, you know, there's so much in this. And if you are enjoying this, I think Mark, we need to call out, jump into the Eckhart Tolle show, Dan Millman. Is there anybody else you think that would be like a good follow-up episode if you're really getting into some of the thoughts of Dan Harris? Yeah, well, we do have a pretty impressive lineup within the rest of the happiness series as well, Mike. But in terms of our our past archive of shows, I mean, I've got to say Tolle was a big uh, Mm. influence for us to, you know, pick up the uh, do not disturb mode and closing the door and getting into to the present moment. What I do. About, feel, what about what about stillness is the key from Ryan Holiday? Well, all the the stoicism work that mm. we've learned from Ryan Holiday is is so important. The the, the lessons from Marcus Aurelius that um, 
Ryan Holiday calls out within stillness as a key is is so substantial because if you can be a ruler of Rome and have the armies <laughs> and the people and he still found time to do um, meditation each day, I think you and I uh, <laughs> can probably do it as well, Mike. So I think there's a nice admission. <laughs> Look, if he did. can rule Rome and he didn't even have the internet, like, that's a pretty capable <laughs> fellow, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But I think it really does speak to an extension of the productivity, the the, the series that we did on productivity, mm. which is meditation. And exactly as you've just said, focus, the ability to remove that fuzziness and actually just find that path to maybe the solution or a new idea that has become clear because you've taken time to slow down, I think is, is another great tool in the, in the armament of how you want to go out and be that little bit more productive. And again, similar to what Dan Harris is saying here, it's little by little. It's a yes. number of different frameworks and habits that then add up to maybe a hundred percent happier. What Dan Harris is finding here with, with meditation is that it makes him about 10% happier. And I love that. Um, uh, I suppose the, the honesty and the mm. authenticity that comes through there. It's not a one-stop shop. It's something that a little bit like Lego, you add together and it builds and it's those building blocks that then equate to a more uh, focused, maybe better version of yourself. Well, talking about Lego blocks and building the best version of yourself, Dan Harris has got more goodies, more tools for us. So let's have a listen to him with five tips to help us with our mental health. May is, as you know, Mental Health Awareness Month. And so I want to talk about five uh, tips for boosting your own mental health. Let me just say one thing. If you're struggling right now, there is nothing wrong with you. If you're feeling anxious because of this situation, that only means you're paying attention. One is sleep. Um, adults should be getting seven to eight hours of sleep a night. So I would strongly recommend that you do your best to go to bed as early as possible. Obviously staying up watching a little Disney Plus or ABC network television or news is not a bad thing to do, but you don't want to stay up too late and see if you can get seven or eight hours of sleep. I think that is an incredibly useful operating principle. Uh, another tip is to um, exercise or just to get some movement in your in your daily life. There's an enormous amount of, of evidence that shows that getting your heart rate up can really help with things like depression and anxiety. Third tip is meditation. Uh, this has, for way too long, meditation has had a reputation of being something exotic or, or, or uh, for hippies. I have spent much of my uh, professional life over the last decade or so trying to change this uh, PR problem. I wrote a book about it called 10% Happier. And there is also an enormous amount of science to suggest that short doses of daily meditation can really help with anxiety, depression. It can lower your blood pressure, boost your immune system, and many other benefits according to the science. Fourth tip is to get some nature. This often can be paired with the second tip, which is to do some movement. You can, all, you can do both of these at the same time. Exposure to nature is really important. And it's been, again, a lot of science has shown that exposure to nature is directly correlated to a sense of well-being. And the fifth tip I'm saving for last because it's the most important. We are social creatures. We are wired for social connection. That is really difficult in a time of social distancing, but getting that social connection is the most important thing you can do, in my opinion, and, and this is based on having looked at a lot of the science, for your own mental health. If you're on your own right now, make it a point to make phone calls and even better, video calls to people you care about and talk to them. Talk to them about what's going on in your life and talk to them about what's going on in, you, in theirs. One way to get yourself out of a rut is to reach out and help somebody else. So doing acts of, of service, acts of kindness for other people, while this can sound a little, a little, I don't know, cliche, there's an enormous amount of evidence that can jar you out of your own rut, your own, often we get into sort of self-centered ruts, but helping other people can really be beneficial. 
I, I want to build on that last point that, that Dan Harris makes there, Mike. Sometimes if I am having a bit of a bit of a slow day, feeling a bit down about something, whatever it might be, more maybe a bit stressed about work, if you go for a walk and you smile at a neighbor or you uh, go and buy, let's say, a coffee, go to your nearest coffee shop and you have a little exchange with somebody, I personally find it really does take a, a weight off the shoulders. And I don't know what it is. It, maybe it's because we're sociable animals or, or something else. But I think Dan's very, very right. In combination with meditation, with sleep, with exercise, this idea of getting social again is is so, so important, wouldn't you say? Yeah. And, and particularly because, you know, maybe post COVID, we have changed some of our social structures and habits and maybe... Mm-hmm. Um, we need to like give it a bit of a boost. I mean, I really like it. I mean, those five things, I mean, what essentials, sleep, exercise daily, meditate, nature, be social. Mm. I mean, in all my years, I can tell you for me, that is a very golden recipe for a great day. One crazy thing this reminded me of, like the nature one was a little bit of the outlier for me. And I did mm. some work on this and there's actually this um, crazy thing that the Japanese have got, which is called forest bathing. And what they have this tradition of for mental health is walking in forests to replenish the soul. I mean, what a cool idea. They call it uh, forest bathing. Don't you think that is just like the coolest way to to get into nature, this idea of forest bathing? Yeah, I, I love that idea. I'm going to have to go and, and search that out, Mike. Maybe I'll book uh, you and I and the Moonshots team into a forest bathing retreat oh. because that does sound like a good idea, doesn't it? Oh, Fresh man. air, animals, really life. I, I, had, I had that experience with being in nature just on uh, uh, a few days ago. I was um, staying in a beach resort and uh, the rain had stopped because it's winter here in Australia and we had a couple of beautiful days where you could just walk on the beach, stand on the mountain overlooking the ocean and it was like I was like an energizer. It was just charging me up to embrace the challenges of life again. It was so damn good. It sounds so healing and, and <laughs> valuable. It and, does, and, doesn't it? You know, when I reflect on, on Dan Harris with the 10% Happier, he's talking a lot about these good practical tips that all add up a little bit like an equation or building blocks into being that, that happier version of yourself. But Mike, we do have one more tip from Dan Harris, as he reflects on how to become that 10% happier in life. And I think we should close out the show by hearing from Dan Harris once more, telling us to embrace the challenge. I can't help myself, but think about it in terms of what I'm trying to accomplish. And every time I get distracted and I come back, I get this feeling of I'm, I'm failing. I'm yeah. not doing it well. Uh-huh. And after doing it for a month and getting no better at it, Based on the name of your book, I'm guessing you understand. It feels like I'm not accomplishing something. I'm not getting better. Why am I doing this? And I just leave more frustrated than I entered. I was hoping you could talk to that a little. Okay, I have a million things to say about that. The big one is you're not alone. I mean, that's the deal. The good news is, let me just leave with the good news, because is that it gets easier. It just does. You know, I've been doing it for five years. It's still hard, but it's a lot easier. And I do much more now than I used to. Um, I do I do 35 minutes a day, and I sometimes do a supplemental second sitting before I go to bed. So I find it helps me sleep. Oh, not because I have to, just because nobody's putting a gun to my head. It's just grown organically, and it's gotten a lot easier. But is it hard? Yes. Um, sometimes people come to me and say, I get it. You make a good case. Meditation is good for you, but you don't understand. I could never do it. My mind is too busy. <laughs> I call this the fallacy of uniqueness. Welcome to the human condition. Everybody's mind is crazy. Think about it like going to the gym. If you go to the gym and it's easy, you are cheating. And if you're meditating and it's easy, you're probably cheating. Maybe you're enlightened or you're dead. (laughs) 
You are fighting, as I said in my speech, a lifetime's habit of just blah, 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 me, me, me. And it is hard to stop that. By the way, you are not having, you don't have to clear your mind. You're just focusing on one thing. That is the game. So drop that. Um, And yet, here I am five years in, and when I find myself lost and distracted, there's like a, I think I use this phrase in my book, a tornadic blast of self-flagellation. The whole game is to just notice that, too. Oh, I'm beating myself up. Let's go back to the breath. And uh, Sharon Salzberg, who's a, an amazing meditation teacher who spoke here yesterday, I had brunch with her on Sunday morning, and we were talking about my problem of beating myself up when I get lost in thought, and she said, it's helpful to have a sense of humor. Because as much as you may think your life is about big things like faith, honor, fidelity, patriotism, whatever, and that may be true, but most of your life, and I, I can prove it to you if you just sit down and close your eyes and watch what happens, most of your life is about, what am I going to have for lunch? <laughs> it's funny, right? So it, we're all assholes, you know? And so like, so just to sit down and close your eyes and then find yourself lost, there, if you can do it with some lightness, if you can do it with a sense of humor, it makes it much easier. And then just know, and I'll repeat what I said at the beginning, that it does get easier. It just does. And so you may not feel like you're accomplishing anything, but I'd like to hear after you do it for a couple of months what people who live and work with you say about you. Because it was my wife who started noticing it before I did. I started hearing her say at cocktail parties, my mother, Harris is less of a jerk. Um, and that really was a good motivator. And you, you, the great teachers will say it to you all the time. The, the real litmus test is what people around you are saying about your behavior. So just keep going. Don't worry. This is unlike everything else in your life where you do something and expect a, a preordained result. Just It requires, and I know this is a sticky word, requires a little bit of faith or trust that it is worth it, and which is what I'm, try, I'm trying to embody. Thank you. Good luck. Oh, boy. It's a lifetime of mind chatter. That's what we're up against. I think once you say that, then you know ah, the battle is on. The, the battle is on with that monkey mind and the best tool that we have in the box is our own approach to things, taking ownership and being aware and being able to go out and give yourself um, a little bit of uh, a practice every single day. Yeah, totally, totally. Well, Mark, thanks to you and thank you to you, our listeners, here on show 189, where we studied the work of Dan Harris, his book, 10% Happier. And his journey started with an awful lot of challenge in the Valley of Darkness, a very public panic attack. And what he goes on to write about is that we're all in a battle with that mind chatter and monkey mind, and we need to find a path of mindfulness. And it starts with meditation, but it doesn't stop there. There's lots of other things, sleep, exercise, nature, and social. Do these things and be ready to embrace the challenge. Be ready to embrace the fact that for your entire life, your mind has been going la, 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 la to you. Slow it down, focus, and breath, and you will find that you can be the best version of yourself. And we can do that all together here every single week on the Moonshots podcast because that's what we're all about. All right, that's it for today. That's a wrap.